What's going on, everybody? This is James Grandmaster Facts Boyce, and you're here for another episode of the Facts Project. Today, I like to bring up a topic of discussion that seems to be floating around a lot more lately than what it should. And that seems to be the act of superhero fatigue. The reason that I wanted to talk about this particular subject is because there is a great article uh, on the ringer.com right now in discussing superhero fatigue in, in its detailed form. But more so, I wanted to kind of tackle this for everybody here. If you're a fan of comic book movies, or better yet, if you're a fan of just even a big two, if you're just a fan of the MCU and the DCU and how they've been able to shape things and pretty much what they've been doing now as far as competition goes. Um, so the best way to start about this is pretty much how we got here. OK, so if we're looking at it and we have to start with Marvel because the Marvel Cinematic Universe for what it was uh, from when it was started at around 2008, 2009, all the way to 2019 with their first three phases. Now, no, we're going from Iron Man all the way to Endgame. We're not talking about the uh, the Fox uh, universe that was built around it. We're not talking about the Sony universe before Spider-Man even jumped into it. Uh, but when we're talking about those first three phases, we're talking about the sum of about, mm, I'm going to say, over 20 films. And we're talking about in between all 20 of those films, we're talking about 22 billion with a B dollars in box office revenue straight up for that universe, for what it was. Because, of course, a lot of that was the first time that happened on screen. It was the first time you've seen comic book characters done in this fashion with connectivity. Now, some of those movies didn't exactly run up to term as far as the critical acclaim or better yet the box office that a lot of them had, even though there was a great share of good movies that did a shitload of revenue, there were some that just were pretty artsy, didn't really bode well. Uh, a lot of people didn't get, and they, some of them even just have a cult following say for instance, like the first Ant-Man movie where there's a large consumerism product of a lot of people who absolutely love the Ant-Man franchise for what it is because it's almost particularly different than the rest of the rest of the universe but to to understand where the they brought out their almost like their own little uh I'm going to say their own little triad of uh Iron Man, Captain America and I'm going to say in, in that fold, maybe um, Incredible Hulk during that time, they were trying to, or or you could even add Thor to the bunch. Let's just, let's just say Thor, Captain America, and Iron Man, those three, because these were the three that pretty much each got trilogies to begin with. And the more that we look at their product and how they, those three characters, those three actors shaped the entire universe. You're talking about three actors who before then, you look at Robert Downey Jr. being someone who uh, had a lot of ridicule in his past life uh, as an actor. Of course, with him going to jail and the, the the drug problems that were happening and persistent before then, when he got announced as uh, Tony Stark, it was like crickets. It was like, nah, I don't know if this shit going to work. And then you bring in Chris Evans, who had just did a superhero movie, of course, in the Fox universe of doing Human Torch. And he's taking on Captain America. And then people were looking at that. Well, first off, let's just say this for the record. Captain America comic books are not necessarily well received. So when you see him on screen, you're, you're, the first thing you're thinking is like, ah, there's, it's going to be like this dull character that's trying to basically be a leader and tell everybody what to do and everything. If he, if he was going to be the way that he is in the comics, because he's almost fucking annoying and pretty much ignorant. Although most of the part, you know, he fights with a lot of morality and then Thor being like the, the, the most OP character out of the three. And yet his storyline, his first two movies didn't really go off that well. 
until the third, which was Ragnarok. So like you're looking at the lens of how like these three characters are going to evolve. And essentially you put some supporting characters out there and these supporting characters, of course, started to bolster this lineup of how this connective, uh, this connective universe was going to work. And the, the climaxes, the post credit scenes, the Easter eggs that led everybody to believe pretty much Marvel was uh, almost had their own promotion team of people that didn't even work for them because everybody was on YouTube trying to figure out what was shown in the movie that a lot of people didn't necessarily know. Did you have to follow a movie, uh, a, a comic book from 1978 and figure out like uh, figurative and literal pro uh, plot points that were pretty much going to bolster up exactly how the movie was going to be. And note, you know, like I always talk about it all the time, like Marvel did not follow any type of like source material. There was inclinations of how the source material was implanted in there, but they didn't follow it to a T because the, pred the predictability of how it was going to turn out. They didn't want people that had read the comics for God knows how long to be like, yo, I know exactly what's going to happen here. And they didn't do that. It was fine because like they inserted characters uh, take, for instance, when I saw Endgame for the first time. And of course, the the part where uh, Hulk gets his ass whooped by Thanos and then he flies to Earth and then crashes through the Sanctum Santorum to the point where he's telling Doctor Strange Thanos is coming. I know that as Silver Surfer, Norm Rad, who's the one that warns Doctor Strange that Thanos is coming. So they made those little like Tiny, tiny little inclinations that they flipped a character and yet it was still the same premise, which is totally fine. What, it, what the thing is that happened was, did they go too high? Of course, Marvel Cinematic Universe probably like holds close to about, I'm going to say, uh, close to 30 characters. 30 characters within, within the universe. But anybody that reads comic books knows that Marvel's entire roster, characters that they that they fit inside of just the comic books themselves is almost endless. The same thing goes with the DC universe. Now, the DC universe didn't necessarily pull any type of connectivity, but essentially because of Marvel's reign and what they were doing, the, the plan of catch-up that DC tried to do in the long run didn't necessarily bode too well for them. But the thing is, they still had profitable movies, still had profitable movies like Ant-Man. Um, I'm sorry, Ant-Man. Aquaman is still a billion dollar movie. Still a billion dollar movie. I mean, is as much as as much as people dislike Batman versus Superman or um, Man of Steel or anything like that, like they made a good, decent portion of money. They did not do a billion dollars like Aquaman did. But they made a lot of money. And no, DC still has one of the most, if not if not two, the first most po popular character in all of comic books, and that's Batman. And anytime that there is a Batman movie or film, regardless of who's Batman, because note that we've seen 12 fucking Batmans, it's going to do well. The, the, the lore, the darkness, uh, the cinematography that they put into Batman movies it always ends up boding well because there's it, it it's it's weird it's like a the crime the war the thriller and the somewhat horror aspect to all batman movies is what bat makes batman movies so profitable and you want to see that You're like it's it's almost this this scary character with a lot of moral fiber to him that just has a like like a compass on him that that just wants to do good for the world but yet is the darkest character possible. Now, as we always talk about within Marvel and DC, DC just didn't pull the right triggers. They may have had all their ducks in a row, but they just did not know how to execute. But still, they made the attempts, as did Marvel. And the thing is, when we, when we talk about the MCU, after Infinity War, after Endgame, which... If you talk about phase three by itself, it's one of the most profitable 
uh, box office revenue builders of cinema in history. Just that portion alone. Uh, it, leading into the last two movies, when we're talking about Ragnarok, Captain Marvel, uh, Black Panther, Infinity War, Endgame. In that order, you know what I'm saying? Like the those five movies, it was like billion, 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 billion. Top grossing cinematic box office revenue generating movie of all time. Higher than Avatar. I mean, no, that doesn't. That's that's what it was at that time. But. When we get to it now, like after 2019, literally, if we talk about the the pinpoint of after Endgame, when Marvel started to release their phase, phase four lineup, and what that was exactly going to be, because you ended up on the highest of highs. Like, like Thanos came in like a fucking wrecking ball, started killing off characters, st dusted the entire joint, and you had to in, in the next movie, you had to get your revenge and you finally got them. What now? You have to start the ball from square one again. And I feel for Kevin Feige in this because you, the connectivity that he got to this point now has to start anew. And to do 10 years of movie magic and then have to reboot and do that entire same thing again with only a certain amount of the characters that you had the last time. You don't have the signature characters anymore. You have to introduce people to more characters. That only happened maybe once in the first four phase, uh, first three phases. Guardians of the Galaxy. C-list squad, basically nobody knew, but the thing is, they had a great story behind them because of James Gunn. And you got him running DC right now. So it's almost safe to say that we are almost at the point right now where we're talking about quality and quantity. Um, right now in phase four, you know, if you if you remember 2021, literally in the middle of the pandemic, um, Marvel started to release tons of shit. And I'm talking about like six Disney Plus shows, four movies. Like it was like uh, you had WandaVision, you had Miss Marvel, you had Moon Knight, you had um the Loki series, the first the first one, you had Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Um it it was it was a lot during that time. Like Doctor Strange, Multiverse of Madness that came out like pretty much at, at the at the tail end of that. Spider-Man No Way Home was uh was also in phase four, so that was pretty much happening. It Black Widow finally got that solo film out of the way, as far as like a a somewhat prelude to connectivity from phase three and the phase four after Endgame, but it was it too much too soon you know there was it, of course if anybody remembers from back then if we're talking about 2008 2009 we maybe have gotten we used to get one marvel movie and i they, we get that one marvel movie you might have got another one in two years but to have 10 properties being done in that year like uh, i'm not even going like hawkeye happened during that time and you know like uh the she hulk was happening during that time like we're talking about tons and tons of properties at the beginning of phase four tons so why the speedy process you know i i, I realized that in order to work for marvel and do the things that they've done you tend to, you know, attract a lot of young talent, writers, directors, and Marvel likes to do that. They like to bring in a lot of young talent, whether it, even in, even in the actors, you know, that they bring in the actors and actresses that they bring in are a lot of fresh faces. And, it, and the same can be said for the writers and directors that are basically in that room. And that's OK. DC, on the other hand. Always had the CW and the CW. Weirdly enough, had a lot of connectivity. You know, they did crossovers. They had Prices of Infinite Earths and everything like that. They they tried their best. They had more connectivity in the TV shows than they did for the movies. So the obsession for wanting DC to succeed 
started to show on a lot of the fans that are pretty much out there. And I talked about this on the podcast before that the obsession for wanting that universe to do well affected a lot of folks, you know, the, the cult like, um, fanatics around Zack Snyder's justice league only proved to be a disheartening service to how the movie was going to get done. I mean, no, they did something that no fan base has ever done before. And it was like, okay, if there's a portion of the movie that a lot of people want to see, and I feel as though that, that, that movie was wrong. Then we felt like we got the wrong product. And if we bitch like a motherfucker, we're going to get the right product. And then when you finally get that product, it doesn't do the numbers enough for us to be like, you know what? He was right. And this movie is fucking awesome. Let's continue this universe. That didn't happen. That didn't necessarily happen. And this is all the while, while, you know, while pretty much phase four is going along. So it's like, if this portion of DC falls apart and then we're doing an overconsumption of superheroes with, and, and I'm not going to say they're poorly written, it, it's a starting point, but it's a lot. So is it difficult to follow? Maybe it might be difficult to follow if you, you if you're not on it a lot. Like before, when we got that one movie, we could overanalyze that one movie. So by the time the next movie came around, we could make our own assumptions as to how it would fit. When there's 10 properties within a year, you're almost looking at it as if, okay, what's this? What's this? What's this? You almost get blindsided because there's so much. You know, this it's the needle in the haystack thing. There's so much fucking hay. And I'm trying to pull out any type of connectivity here. So as of right now, between, and no, we're out of phase four. We're in phase five. We're only um, one movie in with Ant-Man, Quantumania. And the introduction of the new big bad, the, the next villain, Kang. And it's almost even said now because, you know, there was snippets of Thanos. It was hints. You get him full on in the flesh in the first movie. So it's already, you know, the villains directly in your face. You know what his power scale, power scale is. You know what his objective is. And then you come to find out that the because of if you watch phase four and you watch the Loki series, that the variants and the multiverse and how they take shape in how the next set of movies are going to be portrayed only leaves into the following. They're going to overuse an actor. A very good actor, by the way. Jonathan Majors is a very good actor. But they they are obligating him to do a lot. And I like that shit, when Thanos didn't even talk in the first like three movies, like you saw him smile in the first one. Uh, he, I think, I no, no, he did talk in Guardians of the Galaxy, you know, but he didn't do much. He might have had like two sentences, you know, but by the time we got to, okay, I'll do it myself, it was a go. And then you got to see, you didn't know what his powers, you had to look him up. So now we kind of like gotten to the point where we're almost like, I know who Kang is. And now I have to learn of his variants because he probably, they probably had the same skill set. But in every single Marvel movie that's pretty much going to happen, I have to assume that every single villain is going to be a variant of him. Or better yet, I don't know who is going to be a variant of him because that is the objective of the multiverse. Everything that's pretty much been happening to this point, you know. From Doctor Strange, uh, Multiverse of Madness to No Way Home, these are all connected into the into the incursions. And yet, now I have to look up the overconsumption of one particular villain. 
And how are they going to display even more villains? And how are they going to fit all these characters that they introduced in phase four into phase five? So it's like, I want to say that there is no superhero fatigue. I want to say that. Because I want to accept that there is still a little bit of quality over this much fucking quantity. But it's difficult. Um, right now, they Marvel for the past three years was still trying to get revenue from China. Which didn't bolster that much revenue for a lot of their a lot of their projects. You know, I don't know if there was like a particular ban or anything like that or anything that pretty much like kind of like drew them in the wrong direction. But, you know, China wasn't given any type of revenue, was not displaying the movies or anything like that. Therefore, a large chunk of cash was more than likely missing. And I, I think the first project that they took on was Wakanda Forever. So. Now. DC and Marvel now have seat changes that pretty much happen. Now, if anybody, of course, has been following the news, you've realized that James Gunn is now the uh, the co-chair for the DCU, as well as Peter Zafrin, who was a producer on the first Shazam movie. And in Marvel, Bob Iger, who was around for the first couple phases of the MCU, is now back as the president of Disney. More than likely, things are going to slow down a bit at, in Marvel. You're not going to get as many pro projects as you did, of course, in a couple of years ago. That was fucking nuts. And the one thing you can say with DC is that James Gunn is going to more than likely give you better writing. Uh, he is already pretty much given us a blueprint as to how he sees the first phase, and, and no, you know, we never heard that before from DC before, but the first phase of DC movies that will more than likely go out. And, and I think that what they've talked about is that they want to have the ability to correlate the animation, the TV shows, and the movies all in one little sector. They've told you what properties that they're going to do. It's not that many. I think it was seven in total and they've given you the source material in order to cover it if you wanted to follow it we've also now come to find out on the marvel end that they that they want to pull back in the uh and do cuts and there's also been these rumors that kevin five could take an executive in in disney and that that would leave for somebody else to then be the chair of the MCU, almost like the head of of content development for the for for the Marvel Cinematic Universe going forth. And Lord only knows who that could be, because the one thing that we can get out of this is that we will never get. We will never get somebody like a Kevin Feige who understood comics the way it is. And gave us that first, those first three phases for what they were. I mean, that's just plain and simple. That's, you know, like the, the fact that there's a lot of us of a certain age that got to see that on the screen, how it was, that it, there's probably a good reason why there's a lot that you see now on social media, very pissed off as, <laughs> as to how the comic books look now, you know, there's, there's some diehard comic book fans out there. I mean, I'm one of them, but I'm not bitching. Not at all. But I I do respect the planning because um, me, wholeheartedly, somebody who understands business, understands that you, you know, you don't like to see a company do too much too fast. At some point, you got to hit the brakes. And understand that if you're going to do something and you want the quality that you deserve and you want to continue to have billion dollar movies, you have to make sure you go back to the drawing board a couple of times that you get it right. And I hope between the big two, between DC and Marvel, because 
No, there's a there's a lot of properties that are currently out there at the moment that are doing comic book movies the right way. I talked about it a couple podcasts ago about the the plans that Amazon has been doing with their with their TV show properties, and that is absolutely fantastic. Today, um, today I found out Boom Studios, someone is killing the children. Being of course is being adapted by Netflix. If they do that correctly, because the superhero genre can only do but so much. The comic book movie genre that incorporates all of the genres all together, aside from superheroes and the capes and capes and cows, and puts into perspective the sci-fi elements, the horror elements, and not just within the bolster of characters that we've all grown to love and adore, but yet these excellent stories, these Eisner Award-winning stories, these Ringo Award-winning stories that that people have no idea, have never read, but they're brilliant. And if they're done correctly and adapted on TV on that brilliant pace, people are going to be like, yo, there's so much more to comic books that I've never seen before. The medium is amazing. It's the reason I love comic books. Because you can, you can bolster any genre that you want into it. Any age can read a comic book. You can be from age three and you could be 93. There is something for everyone. Vertigo Comics taught me that. Vertigo Comics taught me that there is absolutely a comic book for you. With like V for Vendetta, uh, Cowboys versus Aliens, um, Road, Road to Perdition, uh, Hellboy. Like, like, you know, these were like these, I'm going so far left, and it was like the weirder, the better. So I can only hope that, you know, the personality change that you see in a lot of the characters that are being displayed within the big twos movies goes in the right direction to where they are loved again and that and even if they're introducing characters that you don't know that you look at it and be like you know what i want to check that out if if it's anything to the accord of how like guardians of the galaxy made people feel when they watched it and made household names out of motherfuckers you never even heard of but this is grand uh, james grandmaster facts boys i appreciate y'all joining me Thank you again for watching another episode of the Facts Project. We are out.